Well, this is the uh, hardest part of the weekend, is to come to the finale. Uh, it, I can't thank you all enough for being here and for sharing and getting to know one another and um, making us so happy. I, I just don't know how to thank you enough. Uh, there's one thing uh, before I get started that my friend Dick was um, kind enough to um, look up for me that came out in one of the questions. And if you recall, one of the questions said, um, <clears throat> the minute we put our work on a service plane, the alcoholic commences to rely upon our assistance rather than upon God. And since I hadn't committed that page to memory, I didn't know the context exactly that it was in because it sounds contradictory and it's in the chapter on working with others and on how much help we give the new alcoholic do we actually give him some money do we actually let him into our house do we actually get a job for him do we do all these things out of love for him in order to get him sober and what Bill is pointing out is <clears throat> we don't want to do so much for him that he commences to rely on us and never turns his attention to God. So we have to, that's what, this was in that sense, that we have to see a balance here or he could suddenly become dependent on you for everything. And at the end it says... Um, As long as we depend, uh, as long as we place dependence upon other people ahead of dependence on God, we're going to have a problem. The only condition is that he trusts in God and clean house. So the point of that line was to direct the new person to dependence on God instead of dependence on you as a sponsor. And thank you, Dick. Then the other thing that... Um, I wanted to do, before I start on um, the final talk, it is possible to get a hologram that will enable you to see God. And um, I ordered one. Bill, I ordered one for you, so come on up. I want you to just take a look at this. <laughs> It'll only take a second, and thank, thanks for being a good sport. And this is the only place you'll find God. And you just have to look hard enough, and you will see. This is yours. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I, <laughs> thanks, Bill. Deep down in every man, woman, and child is the fundamental idea of God. It is only there that he can be found. When you draw close, he will disclose himself. And what do you think we've been doing but trying to draw close to our true selves by getting rid of our false selves? Which I think has been the message of the weekend, is how to get rid of everything <clears throat> that is blocking us from our true nature and from God. And um, we actually tried to get rid of time and get rid of character defects. And so we're down to this um, final thing, which is called your own little world. And the idea for this came from the, the expression that people use a lot, and, and it, they generally use it in a derogatory fashion. And you'll hear it in a conversation, a couple of gals are talking about Mary, and one of them will say, well, you know Mary, world. 
And then the other one laughs and goes, yeah, she really does. Well, so do you. So does everybody in this room. And your little world is not my little world. I have no idea what your world is like. There are 55 different experiences here of this weekend. 55 different, and yet we all sat in the same room. It's like 10 people are the eyewitness to a traffic accident. And the cops come, and they haven't got a clue what really happened, because this woman said, no, it was his fault, and this one says, oh, no, this one was going this and that. And you, you end up, and they all looked at the same thing and saw many different things. And so as we talked about earlier, what does your world consist of? And it consists of your perception. That is what your world officially is, is your perception. And as Clancy says, alcoholism is a disease of perception. So as we label the world that we live in, that's where we live. And you're the only one that lives there. And you could be married to someone for 40 years, and you don't know their world 100%. As hard as you can try, you really can't know every little thing that they see. And you can both go to a musical, and when you come home, you were moved by the first act, and she was moved by the second act. And you go, God, how could that happen? I thought I knew her this well. And so, if that's true then there's 6.7 billion little worlds on planet Earth right now. And they're all in collision with one another. And the problem is that no one is at peace with themselves because when you create your own little world, It's filled with loneliness, fear, incomprehensible demoralization, and there's no way to fix it. And we pray to God to help us straighten out this world that we live in, and we should be praying for him to remove the illusion that that world even exists so that we can be in God's world. And so people say, well, yeah, but there's 6.7 billion different worlds, but certainly there is the world. Does everybody have that feeling? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But in addition to that, there's the world. And the answer is, maybe there is and maybe there isn't, but no one lives there. You follow what I'm saying? There is no official world. And you go, there has to be. And so what we're trying to do this weekend is to destroy the world that we built. And the building material for um, our world is thinking. It's all done through thinking. And we started doing it as a young kid, and we just kept building on it. And that's why you see um, when Steve gave his talk Thursday night down in Tampa, which was absolutely hysterical, he gave us a glimpse of his neurotic little world <laughs> as a young kid in grammar school. And the, and the room was on the floor laughing. But at the same time, there was all this pain that he couldn't get out of it. He could, he, there was no way to get out of that. And we keep thinking that there's a way of fixing it, and the mistake we've been making is we have to destroy it because it isn't real. Um, (laughs) I don't know if this line works or not, but I love it. Two guys are at a movie, and there's a long scene in the movie of a pond, very peaceful, Several ducks are skiing and going off to the side. 
And one of them turns to the other and he says, well, you know what I always say? If it looks like a duck and it quacks like a duck, it's probably a movie about a duck. <laughs> so, <laughs> if we looked at our world, we could make the same thing. It's probably a movie about a world. Can you imagine believing that? It's probably a movie about a world, and I'm at this movie, and I think it's real. And it scares the hell out of me. And you are the set designer, the producer, the writer, <laughs> the actor. I mean, you're the, it's all yours, and you ended up believing it. And that's what our ego does. It creates a fabrication and then tells us, this is real, by the way. See that guy in the back of the room? He doesn't like you. Well, I haven't even met him yet. You don't have to. Look at his face. <laughs> yeah, he does look like that guy who hated me in high school. It's his brother. Really. So now I'm in a room. I was comfortable in this room. Now I have a person who hates me in the room. And I'm not as comfortable as I was. And we think it's funny, but we do that all the time. We do that all the time. We listen to one story on the economy, and we're trying to imagine uh, being on welfare. But we still have a job. Yeah, but I just saw what's going to happen, and I'm trying to get used to welfare. <laughs> but you're in a big house and you have some money I know but you can see it coming I can feel it I can feel it it never would have happened if you hadn't seen that little clip and it started this fabrication of a place where you live and so we see it in um, you know isolated things here and there but it's hard to believe that the totality of this charade. I mean, it's just too, such a mind-boggling thing. And of course, Bill gives us lots of clues. Our old ideas avail us nothing. Our problems, meaning our world, we think are of our own making. And then the classic line where he says the idea that we can drink like other people or soon we'll be able to has to be smashed. Smashed means smashed so that that is no longer part of us. It's gone. So we took all the thoughts that go around the fact that someday I'll be able to drink and that whole, um, you know, it would be lines 21 through 30, act one, scene seven, blah, 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 in my life is I will be able to drink someday. And I have that in my sobriety package and I'm wondering why AA isn't helping me. And it's, that's why. Because that's still there. And Bill wants us to go get it and smash it. So that it's not part of our um, world. So when Bill writes in the uh, sixth step in the 12 and 12 that we've been granted a perfect release from alcohol, um, I believe that. I honestly believe that. I haven't thought of taking a drink in, since after I had six months. So that's 43 and a half years. The thought of taking a drink has never, ever, ever entered my mind. Suicide? Yes. <laughs> Eating 65 pancakes to feel better? Yes. Binging on hot fudge sundaes? Yes. But not drinking. That's total freedom. <clears throat> It's absolute freedom from um, alcoholism. It's wonderful. <clears throat> and if it's possible there, then it's possible across the board, which is what we're trying to do with weekends like this, is to expand our horizon and realize 
smashed a third of our world and it gave us a wonderful sense of comfort, but the other two thirds is still there. And if that could be smashed, then you would be fully awakened and you would really see what God sees all around us. Not a bad goal. I think it's the coolest thing in the world. I just think, holy cow. And St. Francis told us that in the last line. It's by dying that we awaken to eternal life. So we get glimpses of our own eternity in um, sobriety. Just little glimpses. Just little. And then we, as we took the um, big bang of AA and saw that it's still happening, you can sense the eternal nature of things including you. And if you could actually experience that eternal nature, what is there to worry about? (laughs) What is there to worry about? The ultimate weapon that the ego uses, which is death, would no longer be a threat. Don't forget, you're going to die. No, I'm not. I'm eternal. Shut up. You see what I'm saying? You couldn't be scared to death. It would be fruitless to try. Um, and so that's, that was the stage that I was setting. And I had a few um, just thoughts that I collected over the, um, over the years. And I'm just going to read them. They really aren't uh, connected, but... I'm going to read them anyway. Ego trickery. I'm at a play, and I get so involved with it that I think I end when the play ends. In other words, it's the end of the world or whatever it is, and I get so swept up in it that I personally uh, feel that it's real and it's going to happen to me. That's the type of play that we write for ourselves. The world is but a reflection of yourself. That ties in with the projector stories that I've done. We're in the projection booth. and So everything we see out there, we generate it in here, put it in the, can- the projector of our mind, and put it up there. Went, wow, it's going to be a bad day. <laughs> And we go out there trying to change it. We go up on the screen and try to get people to move and do this when we ought to go in the projection booth, take the freaking slide out and put one in of the ocean and a palm tree. And then look at that. In other words, (laughs) we think that's real and it isn't. It would be we're at a movie and our favorite stars in the movie and the arch enemy is sneaking up behind him with a hammer, and he's sitting in the chair reading, and we yell, watch out, to the screen, thinking it'll help our hero not get hit. That would be getting swept up in with what's being projected. Um, A perfectly spiritual being falls asleep and dreams he's very imperfect and believes accordingly. How does he become spiritually perfect? By waking up. We don't go in there and try and analyze and get a psychiatrist to straighten out the problems that appeared in the dream. We just have, we just wake up. Um, St. Francis calls the end of our own little world dying. It's by dying that we awaken to eternal life. The analogy could also be applied to a dream. Um, Waking up is the death of a dream. We don't normally call that. We just call it waking up. But it's really the death of that dream. And so if we're going to awaken, it's by dying we awaken. We're going to end the dream state or the self-centered trance that we're in. But the hard part is to believe that that's what's going on. I, you want me to quit that I have? Yes. 
You mean they all could be wrong? Yes. Holy jeez. I mean, that's too much. I could be wrong that I was an alcoholic. I'm wrong that this guy's really a nice guy. We pick three, four, five. You remember that? And the first time we admitted we were wrong, it, well, you've heard me say that my sponsor trapped me into a corner where I just had to agree with him. And it hurt like hell because I, I was so entrenched in my position. And I finally said to him, all right, you're right. And he said, no, you're wrong. And I went, well, it's the same thing. Well, say it. And it was, I'm wrong. I could barely get the words out. I'm wrong. I'm wrong. And um, as we do the fourth and fifth step inventory, we start seeing, you know, I was actually wrong about that. I was actually wrong about this. And this is a process of acquiring humility. And the more we admit we're wrong about something, the freer we get of the old ideas and the happier we start to get. And I think I mentioned earlier, a great turning point came when we saw humility as something wonderful rather than something we had to do. Chuck called it uncover, discover, discard. I'm sure every time he found that he was wrong about something, he probably applauded, thanked God, and went, yay, and threw it away. <laughs> oh, boy, I'm wrong about that. And throw it away. Everything we're wrong about is a burden. We're carrying it on our shoulders. It's causing friction. It's causing harmony. It's causing us to see each other as separate people. It's causing us to see threats from this person See, all of that, and oh, gone, gone. So the more we throw away, and the only way to throw them away is to be wrong. Yep, I'm wrong about that. Yep, I'm wrong about that. Pretty soon, it becomes fun to be wrong. Oh, boy, I'm wrong. Oh, boy, oh, boy, oh, boy. Did you ever think you'd go, oh, boy, oh, boy, oh, boy, I'm wrong? Delighting in being wrong. I'm wrong. Oh, God. And it, and it works in spirituality. You, have a, you get a breakthrough and you have a, a sense of the world and then someone comes along and shows you another sense, even higher. And you go, oh boy, oh boy, there's something better. Not, well, you showed me up. See, that would be the old reaction. Oh, you had to say that and make me look bad. Instead of, oh my God, that is exciting. I love that idea. And, and we can keep moving on. So being wrong is, well, we got two steps. <laughs> two steps about it, right? Fourth and tenth. When we're wrong, promptly admit it. We could actually change that to eagerly admit it. Oh, boy. Guess what happened to me? Now, you may think that um, this doesn't become part of our nature, but it really does. <clears throat> and I'll... I eat lunch with guys all the time. We go to noon, meet Yana, and then we go off to a restaurant. These guys joined us, and we sit around the table. And I love to compare the conversations now with what they would have been if we were back drinking and not self-centered and not an AA. Because I remember all the conversations. You'd sit down and say, well, what are you up to? Oh, man, I'm screwing my secretary. I shot a 73 on the golf course. I'm closing a goddamn deal you wouldn't believe. When I get through with this freaking deal, I'll tell you it's going to be great. And then the next guy has to top that. Oh, well, you had a 72. I had a 71. I'm in there pumping the weights. I'm up to 451. I'm running. I'm running. I'm signing up for the marathon. The marathon. You remember? You're a lazy ass. I run the marathon. And I'm doing that. And then this guy comes around here. Well, I wrote a new play, and everybody's going to come. They go around, around. There's the conversation. We've all been in it. We all know what it looks like. And nowadays, I won't sit there. I'll get up from the table and walk away. I'm not going to sit and listen to that stuff again. So we go, and that's the AA guys sitting around. Well, how's your week go? Oh, God. I really screwed up at work. I was so abrupt with one of my fellow workers. God, it was just, I can't believe I did that. And I had to go back and make an amend. And now we're, everything is smoothed out and... It really is nice. So I had that one screw up. 
Oh, you had one screw up? Uh, I had two screw ups this week. <laughs> we still have to top each other. But we're topping each other with our character defect admissions. We're actually being honest. And then we all connect with one another. Yeah, I did that. Yeah, I did that. Well, geez, I wasn't going to talk about this, but now that you talked about that, I had this thing, and I was, oh, God. But somehow I called my sponsor, and, oh, is it nice to be on the other side of that? Here we all are sharing our imperfections. Boy, is that a... Ernest Kurtz has a book, The Spirituality of Imperfection. We're imperfect, and if we can all relate with our imperfections, we're the happiest people in the world. Whereas before, with our ego in charge, we had to relate, we're, we're perfect. And everybody we talk to is perfect. Everything okay in your life? Yeah. He's thinking of suicide, and he's going, yeah. Doesn't want to admit to any weakness. None of them do that. So we're free. I just love the conversations. Right, Chris? We sit around, well, you know what I did? You're not going to believe it. And we share that. That is pure humility at work. That is the beauty of being wrong. Every time we're wrong, we are smashing our world, our own little world. And the more we smash it, the more we're going to see God's world. <clears throat> I think, if I'm not mistaken, that Chuck began his video by um, talking to the young people and saying, you probably wonder why I'm here, but you're going to have to face something that every human being tries to figure out, and you're probably not going to be able to do it. And they're all wondering, well, what's he going to talk about, God? What's he going to talk about? It was a brilliant lead-in to have a spiritual conversation. He said, you're going to try and figure out how to live at peace with yourself. Now, think about that. <laughs> no matter who you're talking to, they're going, yeah, I'd like to learn that. And so everyone is trying to figure that out. And what do they try? Getting a Ph.D. Drugs. Become famous. Write a book. I don't know, but somewhere I will eventually end up at peace with myself. And it turns out that humility is the only way. It's the only ticket out of not being at peace with yourself. Because you built a world that doesn't allow peace. The, the, you're at war with yourself. The inner conflict is bigger than anything going on in the world. And we must ask ourselves, how can a person who's at war with himself go make peace somewhere? This is the spiritual solution. It has to start with the individual. It has to start with one person getting at peace with himself and showing someone else how to do it and then that person showing someone else how to do it. One person at a time showing the other person the way to get at peace with oneself. And someone might say, well, that's going to take forever. I don't know. I know one organization. They've been doing that for 70 years, and they're all over the world. There are 140 countries. AA. One person showing the one that's, he doesn't go find him. Well, he may go into a detox, but most of the time, the person shows up, you're there, they want a sponsor, and so God's just going, all right, here's the next person. Here's the next part of the plan for the world to spiritually awaken, one person at a time. <laughs> and we're going, well, I think it should be done on a mass scale. You follow what I'm saying? <laughs> this is too slow. We've got to go to whatever it is. And all those efforts are wonderful, but <laughs> if you're at war with yourself and you're going to go teach people about democracy or peace, you're really saying, if you want what I have, and they're going, I don't. <laughs> 
Now listen to me. So in other words, the reason it works so well in AA is the person there has just conquered the problem they're going to sh and show the solution to the next person. There's that level field. And the attractiveness of someone who freely admits their imperfections. I'll never forget the first speaker meeting. Somebody got up there and talked about masturbating or something. I went, oh, my God. He's, he's talking about masturbating in front of all these people. There's old ladies. There's this. I was, I was embarrassed for him. You follow what I'm saying? Oh, my God. He actually revealed that he's got a secret or something, and I got all of these inside of me. And I didn't think you could just go, okay, well, these are all gone now. I thought you had to suffer with them forever. So seeing someone admit their imperfection was quite a freeing thing, and I'm sure it is for all of you. And you suddenly realize, why did I hide that? Why did I hide it? Pride. That's simple, pride. I don't want anyone to think that I'm not perfect. That creates a very lonely world, and that's the one we all lived in. Nobody put us there. We built it. We very carefully constructed an airtight, idea-tight, human being tight, and eventually no light could get in. You keep working on this creation of this world, and uh, the more building material you put up, the more thoughts. Pretty soon, it's very dark, it's very lonely, I'm the only one in there, and there's no hint of God anywhere, because I didn't include him in this world. And it's just, it just sounds so amazing. Chuck talks about it when he drew that circle with the dot on the outside. You remember that? And there's me, and here's the universe. And I experienced that when I read, God is everything or he's nothing. God is everything or he's nothing. He either is or he isn't. What was your choice to be? And I remember going, well, boy, I like that. From this day forward, God is everything. And I remember what a nice feeling it was. God is everything. And I just sat back and went, oh, God's a coffee and this front row. There's God, God, there's God. Look at all the God's there, God's there, God's there. The whole universe is God. No matter where you go in the universe, there's God, there's God, and that star, there's God, there's God. And I got all the way through, and there was the entire universe and me. And I realized I couldn't shake the fact that I existed in addition to the entire universe. I don't know if any of you relate to that. There's the entire universe, and then there's me. Well, <laughs> how could you exist in addition to the whole universe? Doesn't make sense, does it? What if you made up a story that you exist in addition to the whole universe and believed it? <laughs> well, that's what we did. Made it up and believed it. And that's the place where we're all hanging out. And the point of all of this is to try and smash it. Um, well, that's all on that. And I did humility. So now I'll do the... Um, I have all these little stories that are just part of this thing. and The, the reason I do them is that I like them. Oh, I like that story. I'm going to tell that story. Um, which is like being a little kid, which is really what God, uh, Chuck wants us all to be, just God's kids. What are you doing? I just like crayons. I just like crayons. And <laughs> Well, that's nice. And uh, all of us can have our little thing and just enjoy it, as long as you're reveling in it, whatever it is, golf or whatever. It, it just... That's all he wants us to do, is to just revel in it and then share that enthusiasm and excitement with the next person. So anyway, I have this granddaughter, Zoe, and I always make up stories when I go out to California. When, and uh, I think a couple years ago I had one about the, everybody's a hair on God's head. 
And she really loved it. She went home and was all excited about it. So when I went out last time, I had to make up another one <coughs> at Santa Clarita. And uh, so i got to give you the background. Her father is a, a drama director at Redlands University. He's head of the drama department. And his mother teaches poetry. And the daughter, Zoe, 13, takes violin lessons, she's dancing, and she's in every play you can get on, and so she's already going to be the actress, and the, I mean, she just, and she has all the characteristics, and who knows, but her life is the theater, and I thought it was a perfect um, ploy to talk about, and I said to Zoe, there's something in the theater that um, is very important, and it's there all the time, and you're so familiar with it, you forget that it's there, and, um, but it's very important that it's there, and it's the exit door. There's four of them in this room, and they, they all look alike. They have a red light shining through E-X-I-T. And there they sit. But I'll bet as you sat here for the weekend, you rarely said, look at that good exit door over there. It was there, but it was kind of invisible. And when you go to the movies, there's an exit door. There, you can see them. You might glance and see them down there. And the movie starts, and it's as if they turned the lights out in the exit doors. They aren't part of the experience that you're having. They're invisible. But they serve a good purpose should the movie become too real. If you were aware of the exit door, you'd be reminded you were in the theater and that this wasn't real. It is, um, it's very important to understand that we all have an exit door that we came through when we came here. And that door, if we were to stay conscious of it, I call it God consciousness, would forever remind us that this is temporary. And don't take it too seriously. And so I told Zoe that someday the the, the door is going to start blinking. And that will call her attention to it, and it will be her turn to go over and go through it. And when she goes, as soon as she opens the door and the light comes in, she'll remember that light because she's been there for eternity. And she'll go, I can't believe I forgot this. I can't believe I actually forgot. Oh, my God. Yes. Oh, yes. And then she'll reach up and touch God's hand where she's been holding for billions of years and start walking away. And he's going to say, did you enjoy the show? And she'll go, what? I said, did you enjoy the show? I don't know what you're... God, I brought you here, what, 70 years ago? Turn around and look at the door. And she turns around, and on the other side of the exit door, it says, Theater Entrance. Remember, I brought you here. I said, I'm going to drop you off. This is the greatest show. I worked forever to put this show together. You don't remember this? Well, come on. We'll both go back in there. So he comes back through that exit door and starts taking her around. Do you know how long I worked on this set? Look at these mountains. They're 23,000 feet high. Let's go out. Let me take you up there and show you how quiet it is. Look at that. Look at those stars. What do you think of this? You don't see anything in Hollywood like this. This is unbelievable. He took her out to the deserts. Look at this. Miles and miles. Just emptiness. And then took her into the jungles and the animals and just took her all over. Now, that's just the And he started describing it as theater in the round, the big round earth. He said, 
Let me explain something, Zoe. Earth is the greatest show on earth. You can't top this show. I got everything. I have a cast of 6.7 billion actors and actresses. You're supposed to take it all in. And don't be put off by seeming disasters or unfairness. Oh, wait a minute. There's a tidal wave. Look at this. It's coming in. It's sweeping a thousand people right through the exit door. <laughs> did you see it that way or did you see it as a tragedy? Oh, you believed it was real. You forgot it was, you were at a theater. I told you, keep that door in your consciousness and you'll be able to just enjoy the show. And that's what God consciousness is. It is to go, the reality is between me and God. I've been sent here to enjoy the show. The Westerners call it being an observer. It's hard to believe that our only function is to be an observer. <laughs> but when you get a ticket to the show, that's your role. You just take it all in. You're not supposed to get up on the stage and try to correct it. You're not supposed to be the director. You're not supposed to manage anybody. You're supposed to watch it and take it all in. You're supposed to experience life. And uh, so I asked my son later on, and he said that she, oh, she loved it, because it was all about the play and the, the door and all those things. Now, that's an oversimplistic way of looking at our own life. But I find it fun. I find that it takes the edge off of things that can't be explained. And um, I think Jack reminded me of this. <laughs> to put it in perspective, two people who recently finished the uh, life experience are back in the spiritual realm and they're having a conversation. And one of them said, uh, well, how long were you down there? Oh, I was down there 97 years. Whoa, gee, that's getting close to a record. You really took in a lot down there. What about you? I was just there for three months. Ooh, what happened? Well, I was in my crib, and I rolled over into a bunch of blankets and they got pushing up against my face, and they call it crib death. And the other one said, you did that on purpose, didn't you? <laughs> because of their desire to get back, of their desire to get home. So from their perspective, the one who returned the soonest from visiting the show had the best deal which would be the opposite of what we would think here. It's just a way of putting things <clears throat> in a different light so that we don't take our own play so seriously. Um, then I came up with, how do I resolve the problem of my own ego? Who is this guy? Why do I don't like him? Why do I think he's evil? Why do I want to wring his neck? And as I thought about it, I came up with a character that I have decided to name my own ego. And my ego's name is Frank Morgan. Now, if you're old, you might remember that Frank Morgan is the actor who played the wizard in The Wizard of Oz. And the scene I liked the best was when Dorothy pulled the screen away and there was some little guy back there with a microphone going, Watch out for the West, you're Wizard of the West. Watch out for the ball. <laughs> he, was, he was caught. And it turned out 
He was some businessman that got in the middle of this damn thing, and he was happy to go home too. He just got somehow in the middle of all this. So I went back and I said, I wonder where my ego got started in this, scaring the crap out of me and deliberately deluding me and tricking me and doing all these things. And the best I can remember was when I was, um, I don't know, um, eight or seven or something like that in Connecticut, New Haven, Connecticut, walking home. I went by a little swampy area, just going home. And there was a log lying there that if you really used your imagination, you could see was an alligator in Connecticut. <laughs> and I said to myself, oops, an alligator. And my world suddenly got a lot more exciting than it was before I saw the alligator. And I went, did it move? I think it moved. And I run, I'm running home, and, oh, my God, I hope that alligator isn't chasing me. And then I, I was so good at this, recap, re-looking at the log from my bedroom, I thought I heard it in the closet. Oh, there's an alligator in my closet. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. So I was scaring myself to death, but part of me liked it. And I guess my ego said, well, he likes this. I'm going to really get good at this. <laughs> And I think when I finally get to meet my ego, he's going to say, I don't know, I was just screwing around. I thought you were having fun with this. I'm sorry, I didn't know it ruined your entire life. <laughs> I didn't think you'd actually believe it. Well, oh my God, I'm sorry. And then we can both hug each other and sit quietly watching God's world go by. He's going to be happy, and I'm going to be happy. I like that version of an ego, where I can make peace with him, and he can say he's sorry, and we can just drop it all, and that'll really destroy our own little world. It really will. Um, the other story about... Um, how powerful our ideas are when we tell ourselves this is it is epitomized by the story, and, and I know uh, Steve has heard it, the three baseball umpires, and they're arguing who's the best umpire. And the first guy says, well, I, every single time I call him as I see him. And the second one said, well, I call him as they are. And the third one said, until I call them, they aren't. <laughs> and so, <clears throat> we are umpires, and we just look around, and we call that wrong. This is outrageous. That's a dumb. That shouldn't be. This guy, you're out. <clears throat> And that's it. That's the final verdict. The case is over. Case closed. You're an asshole. Case closed. <laughs> it's no appeal. That's it. And, and that's what we do to ourselves. Bam. Case closed. I'm going to hate this guy forever. And we come in here, and now we're going to smash it. We're going to smash all the decisions that were made. <coughs> Just take them all out. Destroy the whole system. And that's pretty freeing. So, let's see. We're getting near the end. and um, So now you have to listen to two poems. And they're awful. <laughs> but I like them, so you're stuck. When you organize your own retreat, you can read your own poem. <laughs> okay, so this is, um, this is my ego's game of hide and seek, which I've, I've been covering. Already. Where shall I hide, I said, where I will never find me. I'm going to play a game of hide and seek with myself. I know. 
I'll pretend that I'm not me, nor you, nor he. I'll hide in a story and pretend that it's real. I'll believe my thoughts and feel my beliefs. I'll lie trapped in a web of painful feelings, forgetting that I created the web. Oh, my God, I don't know where I am. Oh, my God, I don't know where I am. Ollie, ollie and free. Ollie, ollie and free. Nobody comes. Oh, I hid too far. Oh. And this one is, who am I? I am the yin and I am the yang and everything in between. I am the up and am the down. I am the in and am the out. I am the hide and am the seek. I am the black and am the white. I am the life and I am the death. But most of all, I am. Those mean a lot to me because they came as a result of getting the hell out of a lot of my made-up world. And as it got destroyed, the vision of what is around us and how much everyone is the same as me. Everybody in this room is just part of, and we all feel we're part of this weekend but we're part of the whole humanity and we're part of the universe. And we were there at the beginning and we'll be there forever. We're part of something undescribable that goes on forever and our only job is to be part of it. Nothing helps. No figuring it out. None of that. All right. Now, I mentioned, yeah, we're right near, God, I hate to end anything. I mentioned the um, term great moment, which I really like in that 12 and 12. A, something of great moment happened when we saw humility as something we desired. I think that's something that we could reflect on for a long time. If you want something to just sit and ponder and contemplate, just look at that, how he chose the word something of great moment. And again, moment meaning singular, meaning once that moment happens, you will never be the same again. There was you up to that moment, like the moment you got sober. Well, now that you're sober and you're moving along, there's another great moment. And that's the moment when you see humility as something you want rather than something you have to be humiliated to have. The eagerness of being wrong, the delight in finding something else wrong, the delight of uncover, discover, gone. That moment is worth its weight in gold. So you want to look closely and see if that's happened. If it has, you've got to sit back and appreciate it and realize you're really on your way. If you really enjoy being wrong, if you have any sense of the fun of being wrong, you are really getting close. So don't give that up. Just revel in discovering that you're wrong about something. It, it's the, one of the ultimate highs. Oh, boy. Oh, boy. Because <clears throat> everything you're wrong about brings you closer to the truth. Every time you're wrong, you ought to ring a bell and celebrate. Yay, wrong again. Yay, yay, yay. I'm getting closer now. Because this is how it happens. This is the process. What's the secret of life? Being wrong. <laughs> we, could, we could actually make a case for that. Because that is the destruction of self. Self are all the wrong ideas. Every time you're wrong, you're destroying self. And now we're going to approach true self, true nature, spirit, pure connection to God, pure connection to everything in the universe, including all the people in this world. 
<clears throat> and when you see it that way, there's very little that can threaten you or anything. You don't have to have plans. What are the plans of an audience member? Bring binoculars? I mean, that's about it. Where's the bathroom? Those, that's about it. I mean, I don't know. Do you have a big plan book when you go to a play? Let's see. I've got to remember. Or do you just take it in? <laughs> that's it. So that's where we want to get. Now, the final thing, um, and Lee's ready. We're down to our relationship with God. Now, we've worked hard to establish this contact. And when it happens, it's quite an experience. We suddenly realize God is doing for us what we couldn't do for ourselves. That realization is your moment of being tapped. Hi, I'm real. It's no longer a theory. It's no longer what you learned in church, which is knowledge about God. This is tap, tap, I just wanted you to know I really am real. That's what we suddenly realize God is doing for us, what we couldn't do for ourselves. Now, the first thing we do when that happens is to feel wonderful. Oh, man. Wow, that's exciting. Now, the problem is our intellect takes over and starts right in. Well, we've got to figure this out. I've got I to know more about this. I've got to, I've, got to, I've got to. And so we go on a search to understand God. And that will always be a dead end. It's a waste of time. Just forget it. Why do I say that? Because God is a mystery. And the universe is a mystery. And there's two things you can do with a mystery. You can try and solve it, which is what the human ego and intellect does right off the bat. Mystery? Nobody's ever figured it out? Here I come. And I think I talked about science is forcing nature to disclose her secret. We're almost there, we're almost there, we're almost there. That's one way to approach a mystery, is to um, frustrate yourself forever trying to figure it out to prove that you can figure it out. That you're as smart as God. I'll figure this out. I'll figure it, I'll figure it out. The second thing is, is to enjoy it and leave it go at that. Just, I like the word behold. Just behold it. Just take it in. How do you behave when you go to an art gallery with your favorite painter's paintings in there? You go and you sit in front of one and you stay there. Taking it in. I don't sit there and go... Well, I guess first he probably sketched a little of this, and then he probably drew these lines, and then he probably drew those lines, and then, probably, then he probably erased that, and then he probably... I don't do that. I take the totality of the painting and experience it. Music. You just... You don't sit there and try to figure out what each guy's doing, and you just... Ah, oh, wow. <clears throat> we take the creative force and experience it and it's that's so wonderful you go to a concert and you just take it in you experience it you don't try to explain it you don't do anything except have a peak experience of taking it in one of the words i like that we could do with a mystery is to wonder it has a Great sound to me. Sit in a state of wonder. And I think wonderful means full of wonder. <laughs> and there's, there, there isn't anything beyond that to anywhere. It is. It's a state of wonder. 
And our intellect goes, well, you just can't sit in a state of wonder all the time. Why not? Because you've got to take care of the world. No, God's doing that. He just wants you to hold his hand and tell him what needs to be done. Oh, no, 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 no. It can't be that simple. We just hold his hand, stay in a state of wonder. Whenever he wants us to help somebody, we show them how to achieve a state of wonder. Then they bring another person. We show them how to achieve a state of wonder. Then they show someone how to achieve a state of wonder. And slowly the world is being turned into quite a place. Quite a place. Where we're all here watching the show. Who came up last night? Oh, Lauder. And he, he saw a shooting star last night. Did anybody see that by, while we were looking at the moon around the bonfire? And he said, that was the crowning blow. There's these spaced apart little cirrus clouds, that moon. And then a shooting star went shoo across. That's not a bad show. <laughs> I mean, that was, that was quite a... <clears throat> Set production, wouldn't you say? Watch the thing just moving. I wonder how they get the moon to move like that. It's like we're watching, and just every day, there's another play that gets pre prepared for us. Here's the and scene one. The sun slowly rises. How do you like that? Comes up over the horizon. Oh, wow. What do we do with that scene? <clears throat> i got to get down to the goddamn office. i got to go down there and kick some ass today and get this shit straightened out. In this freaking... <laughs> Did you see the sun? Screw the sun. Screw the sun. i got some shit to do. I can't be looking at the goddamn sun. Do you ever have somebody in the audience and you're putting on a show and they're calculating or on the cell phone and doing all that stuff? You say, what the hell are you doing? Well, I've got to run my life. I've got to run my life. And wait a minute. Let go. Absolutely. So if we stayed in the state of wonder, I just wonder what that would be like if we stayed in the state of wonder. And uh, we have a way of closing here that captures that about as well as uh, it's ever, ever been captured. And so before we do that, I'm just going to say goodbye to everybody. And I want to thank you on behalf of all the, our staff and uh, people who put this thing together. And I would suggest that if you take this next couple of minutes with you, for the rest of the year, that you'll have one fine year. I love you all.